The Buddha is famous for having said, all of uh, his 45 years of teaching can be encapsulated in one sentence. And I like to say, on the off chance he wasn't just kidding around, maybe we should memorize that sentence. Because like, you know, you get 45 years of the Buddha's teachings, one sentence, you put it on your iPhone, you know. And, <laughs> and then consult it so you don't have to memorize it, you know. And that sentence is, nothing is to be clung to. The operative verb is to cling, grasp, self-identify. Nothing is to be clung to as I, me, and mine, the personal pronoun. So if you want a great compassion practice, how about just being aware of how much selfing goes on, how much the personal pronouns like run the whole show in the narrative domain. But if you drop into mindfulness, then all of a sudden it's not like that shuts off and we're not trying to shut it off, but all of a sudden there's another kind of knowing that comes online that has the insula involved in it and there's lateral networks and that has to do with the present moment, no time. That life is only unfolding here and now. That can hold all of the other stuff that comes up in a way that's liberating. So what John Teasdale is saying is that in working memory, when we actually exercise the muscles of loving kindness and compassion and mindfulness, they transform working memory. They change the content of working memory from the more propositional, like I'm a shit, I've always been a shit, I'll never succeed, I'll never be, I'm too old. All of those kinds of thoughts, you know, uh, that the cognitive therapists spend a lot of time trying to substitute a better thought. The radical, liberative, mindful approaches just see it all as thinking. And it's all about as interesting and as useful as what you had for breakfast three days ago. You're not gonna judge it one way or another. We don't have to substitute one thought for another and, and all of a sudden pump ourselves up how great I am or I am capable of this or that. But to simply actually rest in awareness and let the thoughts be like weather patterns in the mind. And then all of a sudden what is happening, what's coming online is a whole other way of being that is this holistic implicational memory. And that often um, is felt in the presence of each other. So in an MBSR classroom, for instance, within a day, it's a sangha. And people are coming back, and we have such a low dropout rate, right? in part because it's, people hear what everybody's there for, and it's like, geez, I didn't even know there was that kind of suffering. And you hear other people's kinds of suffering, it puts yours in a certain perspective, it doesn't diminish it. Although some people come to us after the first class and they say, you know, I don't think I belong in this class, I don't have enough suffering. <laughs> and so, no, no, it's okay, if you're human, if you have a body, you'll, you'll, you'll be just fine. <laughs> but they look around the room and aside from this other thing, you know, which is very good if you have heart disease or cancer or chronic pain or HIV or whatever, and you're looking around the room and you hear other people's stories, that listening is an act of love. This taking your seat is a radical act of love, of self-compassion, of wisdom, just to drop in. And listening, if listening isn't a compassion practice, I don't know what is. So let's not make it too special, this compassion stuff. I mean, just being present and being there for the other and hearing in this implicational meaning mode so that we're not thinking and judging and evaluating what the person's saying, but it's going straight into the heart. It's like, and people say different things, like inwardly, they never say this out loud. I'm glad, I thought I had it bad. I'm glad I don't have what that person has. But they want to come back next week because they want to see what is going on with that person, not just with themselves. And they're motivated to practice deeply because we set a very, very high bar. Not impossibly high, but really high. And then people, move to it because they've never been invited to actually think of themselves as a genius before. That this is actually the most fundamental work of being human, is the being part, not any doing. And that there's an architecture and a topology to the domain of being and that we can familiarize ourselves with it, become intimate with it, and then learn to navigate the ups and downs of what's going on, working with the actuality of whatever you've brought and that is the full catastrophe of the human condition, the absolute full catastrophe. You name it, we see it. And so just being heard, being seen, being met, and then being in a community. One of uh, my former friends from MIT, who was a professor of MIT, who came to the MBSR program after um, years and years after I knew him in the 70s because he needed a bone marrow transplant. And he thought, before I go into the isolation unit for a bone marrow transplant, 
I need to actually learn how to be in touch with my mind. He knew enough to do that. And when he came to the MBSR classes, he, he said that he loved being in the MBSR classes a lot more. It was so much more, he felt so much more at home than in MIT faculty meetings. <laughs> which, which are more like, I haven't seen the movie, but I've heard enough about it to know MIT faculty meetings back in those days were more like the Hunger Games. <laughs> or Clockwork Orange or something like that, you know. So. He, and he called it the community of the afflicted. The community of the afflicted. And then he's riding on the MTA, um, the MBTA in Boston. And at a certain point, he had this realization. And he reported this in class. He was just not even looking around, but just feeling the people in his car, in the subway car. And he realized the entire world is the community of the afflicted. And it was like things just got bigger for him. It was a transformative moment, a healing moment, a moment of profound compassion. And not about self, not about myself, me, myself. Mm -hmm.